welcome. Let's talk about mobility. You are all here today, which is first of all great. Second of all, it means that you move from somewhere. So you have been mobile today and probably you're mobile every day or most of the days. Mobility is important. Mobility is something that touches us all. And therefore, I want to ask you how it feels to move around in a city like Berlin. So maybe it feels exciting. It feels exciting because there's so much energy on the streets. There's so many people you see so much. Maybe it also feels kind of innovative. There are so many new kind of mobility services, shared cars, shared bikes, basically shared everything. Or maybe it also feels a little bit annoying. Unfortunately, this annoying is something that is real today in Berlin and also many other cities. So despite all those mobility offers that we saw coming, entering our cities over the last years, despite the fact that a lot of effort, a lot of time and a lot of resources have been put into building biking infrastructure, particularly during the COVID pandemic, and despite the fact that we in Berlin are honored to have something like the most lovable public transport company on this planet here, mobility remains quite annoying still. So I brought some numbers just to show you what I mean by that. 130,000 traffic accidents each year. So there's a lot of small stuff in there, cars bumping into each other, but also really dangerous stuff. Like today, people are dying on the streets of Berlin. Mobility can be dangerous. 71 hours. This is the time an average Berlin person wastes in traffic each year. And I don't mean like sitting in a car and going from A to B. I mean, like be literally stuck in traffic, like sitting there, wasting time, not moving anywhere. And the third one, this is not technically speaking a number, but it's just nice because it shows the tremendous creativity that goes into parking and sculpturing our public space in Berlin. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the creativity we're looking for. This is actually quite annoying for a lot of people. So mobility can be annoying in Berlin, but also in a lot of other places in the world. And we see that if we have a look at the numbers. So there's an election upcoming pretty soon in Berlin. People have been asked, what are the things that are top of your mind when you think about the election? Mobility is almost at the very top. The other one is housing, which is a big problem in Berlin as well. But people think about mobility, people talk about mobility, and unfortunately, people argue about mobility a lot. It's quite annoying, often. Good thing there's hope. So probably you've seen some of these pictures. These are from places like Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Paris. Paris is a great example. Basically, people reinventing their city based on the concept called 15-minute city. Uh, the last picture, that's superblocks in Barcelona. So there are cities around the world that have started to reinvent mobility and to reinvent the way we are interacting with public space in urban areas. Even more good news, these four are not the only ones. So last year we did a research, uh, we did a study where we ventured out to see which cities are progressive, which cities do stuff, which cities do reinvent urban mobility. And we talked to a little bit over 60 cities worldwide to find out what are the things that actually work. One major takeaway from the study is visions work. So what is a vision? A vision is quite fluffy, like some clouds, like some drawings, whatever, but a statement that says how the world looks in 2035 or 40. That's a vision, yes. But, and this is the major insight that I want to bring to you today, if you do them right, they actually work as quite hard tools in managing and transforming urban mobility and to change the way that people interact with public space in urban areas and probably beyond. So why are visions that interesting and why are they so helpful for transforming urban mobility? In our research, we found three major points on this. First one, alignment. If you have something that everyone aspires to, that's kind of aligned, that people like, that people want to have in the future, it makes a lot of very small, nitty-gritty, managerial planning discussions much easier because whenever you start kind of having a gridlock between one person that wants to have parking space, the other one that wants to have some sort of bus rapid transit, whatever, 
you can go back and ask yourselves together, what does bring us closer to the vision that we defined together? Second one is focus. So a vision can help you to focus your energy, to focus your attention. So which event am I going to participate today in? What is the first paragraph of my speech? Where do I put my time in my weekly planning? Um, but also in terms of money, sort of what do I invest in? And the third one is resilience. So if you know where you want to go, it's much easier to actually react to external shocks like the COVID pandemic. We've seen that in a lot of cities. The cities who were, knew what they were doing, who had a plan before, were much quicker and much more resolute in reacting and actually grasping the opportunities that lay in this overall quite annoying thing called the COVID pandemic. So vi visions can work. Question now is, what does a vision need to work like that? And as I said before, this kind of fluffy thing really doesn't work. So nice painting and saying, okay, we want to be carbon neutral by 2023 or 2033. That's not enough. And we identified four things that have to happen to make a vision work and to make it a tool for change in urban areas. The first one is build an ambitious story that puts people at the center. This has two parts. First one, ambitious. So don't Try like nitty gritty 1% more of that, 2% less of that. So don't do this classical planning, extrapolating from the past into the future. Just be bold. Go into the future and define how you want to live, how you want to act with your public space, how you want to move around. Build this image and then kind of plan, like backcast, plan from the future back to the present. Also, put people at the center is very important. It has to connect to the everyday life of people. So if you put some abstract KPIs on top of it, of some very technical language, people won't kind of connect to it. It's, yeah, it's nerdy. It's very technocratic. So use words, use a language that relates to people's everyday life. This is how it starts. Then we have two very important things that come with it and that are very important in formulating the vision as well as implementing it and making it more concrete. Engage the right stakeholders at the right time. So don't sit in your little office or wherever you like to sit and define a vision for yourself. Take or like understand which people in your city are important, get them around the table and define the vision with them together. Only if a broad array of stakeholders actually has ownership in a vision that can work because they are the people who have to help implementing the vision afterwards. And together with that, use public engagement to build a city-wide movement. So do the same with people. Just go out there, make the city known. You wouldn't believe how many visions or like strategy documents there are that no one knows about. This is a very public matter, as I said in the beginning. People are very concerned about mobility. So go out, have a conversation with them and talk to them and find out what they want. So that's very important. And then still, okay, now you have like an aligned fluffy thing. Um, so therefore you need a fourth thing, which is transform your vision into a living strategy. You need this bold idea about the future that connects to people's lives. You need to align that with stakeholders, but that alone won't help you. You have to break it down. You need key performance indicators that help you measure where you are, where you want to go, and if you get there or not. You need to break it down into a concrete strategy, into concrete measures. You have to assign accountability so people know that it's their task to actually implement those measures. And you have to generate transparency about how you do and probably also adapt on the way when you realize some things work and others don't. So when you have all those four things, our research shows, you can get there. You can have more livable cities, more likable mobility, reinvent public space, and make it more human-centric. So this is an image of Amsterdam. And maybe you say, well, isn't that a bit easy? Isn't this like, okay, you put some stuff down here, it will never work. Amsterdam, well, that's, that's Amsterdam, right? It's not us. So I want to share you, with you to conclude one anecdote of our interviews with uh, a city planner uh, from Leeds in the United Kingdom. So he had the same problem. <laughs> what normally happens is you show people what happens in other places, show them how cool things can be, and then they respond stuff like that. But we're not Amsterdam. It's kind of depressing, obviously. Like, your city is smaller, your city is bigger, your city is 
less wealthy, more wealthy, more hilly, colder, rainier, whatever. You can find a lot of excuses not to go that, that go down that road. But then, look at this. This is Amsterdam. Actually, this is the very same street that I showed you before, only not today, not in 2023, but in 78. So it's like the 70s and 80s. Actually, by the way, that guy in the pink shirt, he gets a lot of credit today, but he's cool. And he's running around in a very, very nice neighborhood. So cities can change. And the interview partner from Leeds put this in a very, very nice way. He said Amsterdam was not Amsterdam 30 years ago. So these four things that I just presented to you, they work. And if you have someone who says, this will never work here, don't believe them. All, all these places that, that where it has worked, that have managed to, to rebuild public space, they started from somewhere. They started from cities that look like a lot of cities do today. So it is possible. And with that, I just want to close to say, let's, not, uh, let's stop dwelling on today's problems. They are important, obviously. We have to tackle a lot of problems today. And let's do that, but let's not get stuck there. So it is important, but at one point it becomes unproductive. So let's stop dwelling on them and instead start imagining a better mobility future, see what can be in the future, and let's do it now. Thank you.